Oh. Okay. Hi, everybody. Wait, wait. Yeah. Hi, wait. Let me. Okay, okay. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, you can go. Hi, everybody. This is Dr. Chen. Today is April 11, 2 p.m. It's for in-service for Kino Nursing Home uh, about uh, today's uh, topic. Basically, it's uh, uh, COVID-19 Wuhan pneumonia issues that uh, the nursing home is facing. Uh, that the pressure is going uh, building up. So we need to prepare and uh, try to see what we can do. And uh, in the first part is uh, some information that I overview about this pandemic issue. And I, I drew these pictures talking about the so-called Wuhan super atomic bomb because it started at the end of the 2019 from the China. And because of this is a huge the pandemic issue that the like a, uh, atomic bomb, that the crowd is spreading to all over the, the world. I think it's around 187 nations and causing lots of damage and cause, cause uh, lots of the very new, the cultural revolution that we have changed all everything including our working environment, working culture, learning culture, uh, uh, conference and shopping, eating, everything changed. So I, I drew this picture as a Wuhan super uh, atomic bomb that uh, affect the whole world. And uh, Unfortunately, that the, the world become the mask that closed down everything. We've been locked down everything and uh, very, very uncomfortable. And uh, we cannot go anywhere, cannot do anything. So we put a mask for everybody if you go outside and also if you are taking care of patients. So that's kind of issue and the effect all of us. And uh, I, this, this is a picture from, from internet. Some, someone created this, that the, the virus come from China and uh, is kind of uh, terrible. And uh, because of the so huge, uh the damage to the economy economy that the the ball is almost dead right so that means uh that we are we locked down we've been locked down and the social distancing and uh, we don't cannot do anything cannot go everywhere and uh so the economy is being shut down pretty dramatically and it's hurting everybody. So now all of us, especially medical professionals are having lots of lots of difficulties. It's burning up our head because of the, <laughs> because of the heavy care and uh, lots of casualties, very high casualties and uh, very risky to our medical professionals, but also in all different kinds of professional that they, they are losing job and uh, cannot do anything. So the worldwide is having really, really hard time. So this is a case that in the Kirkland that uh, this uh, old lady, 87 years old lady, she was helping, she was helped by the, her, her son who is a retired nurse to go to the, the nursing home to visit her husband. 
she, she uh, he was uh, isolated inside the building. So this has been separated because of the this pandemic issues that the senior late people, they have to be separate. And this is in uh, Kirkland, I think it's a life of care nursing home. So now the worldwide has so lots of the cases and uh, we need the uh, isolation. And uh, this is a picture from internet that the uh, Cambodia, they use this kind of simple isolation room. And this is the New Zealand, they use the RV as an isolation room and all different area they have try to use the isolation to keep those uh, positive patients. So all these give us a surprise that the that the people are enjoying the were enjoying the life and suddenly this come out, especially for the past one month that uh, that everything changed. And uh, you can see in the news that the people die and people are suffering and uh, panic, anxiety. So this is uh, the picture of the coronavirus, that so-called SARS-2 COVID-19. Uh, this is a virus, the model of the virus. This is an envelope outside and there's a strike. And this is the inside RNA virus. And the virus cannot survive without using the live cells. So they use a strike to get into our cells, especially the respiratory system. And then the once they get into our cells, then uh, they can replicate their RNA and then kill the virus, uh, kill our cells. So this is how it get into the our system because of the strike. There's a, some, some protein here can bind to the cell or, or our cells, then get into the cell and then uh, replicate the small virus, the RNA and then code and then kill the cells. So it's so, uh, so uh, terrible that uh, we, we don't know what happened it's kind of a very severe uncertainty. And uh, you can look back to 18, uh, 1918 Spanish pandemic flu, flu that uh, 15 million people die. That was during uh, right or during and right after the World War I. At that time, the virus spread by the returning troops and travel by the ship and it's, much slower than now, but because right now the virus travel by the airplane with cost uh, tourist and is so fast. That's why it is spreading to all, all over the world. So now we are talking about the how the virus get into our system from the nose, from the mouth, from the eyes, get into our upper respiratory system and then into the lower respiratory system. And even look at this uh, alveola in the, in the lungs. They are the, uh, at least the four billion alveola in our lungs, both sides. And you can see small alveola. The virus come into the, the lining of the alveola and enter the cells and then damage the cells, kill the cells. And the, because of this, the slug stay in the system, cannot move it out, especially the senior people or the poor immunity and old weak people that the, their lung function is poor, that they cannot uh, kick the, the mucus or the slug out to the system. So the building up those slug in the system, especially in the lower part of the lungs, and that causes pneumonia, also causes uh, edema and uh, heart failure. So, in the end stage of the condition, that the the patient only you can use certain part of the lung to breathe, 
that's why their respiratory rate is very fast to 30, 40, 50 per minute. So it's so tiresome that the, 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 the uh, later stage uh, patient become a uh, failure of the respiratory muscles and uh, respiratory failure and then die. So that's the most serious uh, way to cure those uh, the people. So, so that's why we wear mask to keep the virus into our system, the, the respiratory system. And now, because in the past we use the surgical mask to to protect um, to protect the, the people who carry the uh, the virus to avoid the spreading out. But now the CDC and the NIH change that uh, even the the regular people, if you go out to have little bit crowded area, then you have to wear the mask because of the cases in the, I think it's a sketchy mountain area that people around 40 to 60 people in the church get together and they have choir team practice because the singing can produce tiny droplet, even patients are carrier and asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic. They have proved that the 25% people might be able to spread out the virus. That's why now we encourage people, if you go out to wear the clothes mask or surgical or any kind of mask to uh, protect from getting the droplet from asymptomatic people. So this is how the virus kills us or infect us. And uh, lots of people are talking about how long the virus stay on the surface. See here, this is one of the uh, research, the report, but there are all different kinds of conclusions, like the plastic surface of five days and paper four to five days and glasses four days. And the wood is about four days, still 48 hours, surgical gloves eight hours, and aluminum two to eight hours. Oh, since, yeah. So now everything changed that uh, in the past, before February or before January, we were able to travel everywhere to greet each other, to join everybody, have a party, have our regular activities. Now we have to wear a mask to protect ourselves to have a social distancing to protect ourselves. Also, even when we taking care of our patients, we need to wear pretty heavy uh, protection PPE to protect ourselves because it's so risky and uh, so uncertain. So I drew this picture that uh, we need to do our regular activities and there are lots of uncertainties, lots of COVID-19 or SARS-2 virus around us that we need to be very, very, very careful. Uh, also, because of doing that, we are so nervous. We need to get together to help each other to avoid compassion fatigue that is no good for everybody and no good for our daily activity and no good for our work. So we need to help each other, encourage each other and get together and work together. So still we are medical professional, we are hero and heroes of our society or community. We work hard, we try to do our job and protect, uh, take care of our patients and still we need to help or protect ourselves to help this country. So this is the first topic that I give the overview about the, what happened and what we are facing in our daily life or daily work or daily activities. Now, the next topic is uh, the transfer between nursing home and the emergency room or hospital because uh, they are building up the pretty bad of pretty uh, heavy 
issues that the we send the patient to the emergency room, we need to have a good communication with the emergency room because we need to know or they need to know how they can evaluate or help the patient and they need to have a better data or information before patient arrive the ER or they need to communicate with nursing home to decide whether it's appropriate to send the patient to the emergency room or not. So this is a uh, the article in the Journal of Geriatric Emergency Medicine that uh, I believe this is a case uh, in the Kirkland, but uh, they did not say anything. They just said, uh, this is a, a 80 year old female nursing home patient. She has a moderate dementia and the COPD and the hypertension. She was fine until one day, that's a Friday. She started having some cough and low grade temperature on Friday, Friday evening. And because of this environment that increasing uh, COVID-19 cases in the area, so the family wants to, the, the medical team to do something. So the oncologist physician ordered CBC, chest X-ray and the respiratory viral panel and waiting for the result and also put the patient in isolation room. By Saturday, the chest X-ray come back uh, is uh, only interstitial edema and, uh, and uh, which correlated with the COPD and all the lab, the CBC and respiratory viral panel are all negative. So patients stay in the isolation in the room of the nursing home, but because of no medical uh, uh, team or clinician can come to see her in the, on the weekend. So the daughter insists to send the patient to ER and there were no communication between the nursing home and the ER. So when the patient arrived at the ER, patient has a mother dementia that she can only uh, recognize herself and have a regular communication, but cannot remember all of her medical history. And so there's no way to know what the reason and what the, do we want the ER to take care of this patient. So the ER just uh, uh, do the basic. Uh, again, the chest X-ray, CBC, and uh, respiratory viral panel, and also put the patient in the hospital isolation room. And at that time, the, the ER physician has very simple information only, no the advanced care planning, no P-O-L-S-T in the chart. So by Monday, patient's condition got worse. She become uh, favorable and uh, dyspnea and also hypoxia and the mental status also change. So the repeat chest X-ray shows uh, reticular opacity and also still waiting for the virus test. So because of the hypoxemia and the chest X-ray changes and mental status changes, patient need to be admitted to ICU, but there's no ICU bed available and the hospital only have three ventilators left. And this is a 350 bed hospital. So it's very, very critical. So now the issue is, should the patient be intubated? Should the patient be admitted to the ICU or not? What is the advanced directive? So now they bring up some issues that uh, we're gonna answer later. First one is, what is the current recommendation for COVID-19 in the nursing home? <clears throat> what is the care or difference of the care between among the long-term care facility 
and what is their capacity and what is the risk in the infectious pandemic issues. What if the patient has relatively stable and negative finding in the ER, can the patient come back to nursing home without negative test of COVID-19? Means if or will the nursing home take back this patient or not? There are lots of the benefit and risk uh, thinking. And what happened when the patients transfer from nursing home to the emergency room? What's the preparation of the basic data, like a history and the current condition and the goals of the care and how aggressive the management on the patient? That uh, those information need to be available to the emergency room. <laughs> then, if the patient has been transferred to the emergency room, if she is indicated to be intubated, does she really want it or not? Or to be in the ICU, is she appropriate or not? So all those questions need to be answered. And also that the ER physician and the medical team need the advanced care planning or POLST available. So now, and this article is talking about the communication between the nursing home and the clinicians called sleepist and the ER physicians and the discharge staffs that they need to communicate because once the patient is evaluated in the ER, if they decide not to admit the patient, need to transfer back to the nursing home, how do we do that? And we need to focus on the ACP or POLST for the better communication. And we need to think about the benefit and risk for the COVID-19 cases in the staff, in the uh, nursing home. So <clears throat> since this uh, outbreak of the COVID-19, the, I think every nursing home has been followed, following the, the CDC guideline that uh, we are uh, doing pretty good, uh, the major to educate our staff like a frequent hand hygiene and disinfection and limit the staff, patient interaction and social distancing with the facility and try to reduce those uh, con contact between the staff and or among the staff and uh, the patient or resident or visitors and also restriction of the visitors and only also rest restriction of the, the non-essential personnel to come to the facility. Also, we are doing the login of the name of the healthcare for personnel who work in many, many other facility. Also, we uh, screen the staff for symptoms and restrict the work restriction if symptomatic. Also, we offer in the tele, uh, many facility staff offering the telehealth. And we are talking about this in the future because we might, our medical clinician need to do this also. <laughs> and also we do the active screening for the symptoms on the patients and uh, place in the symptomatic patient in the in the list of the monitoring and we supply the PPEs. Why do they mention that? Because of the, in the assistant living or retirement home, they don't have PPE or very limited. But in the nursing home, we supposed to have pretty among, good amount of this PPE. And also we put the patient in the isolation room for pending respiratory viral panel result. And uh, we also consult to the 
local health department if we have a suspected cases. And because of the very tight of heavy care situation right now, uh, we try not to send the patient to the ER if it's possible. And this is really difficult care or risk for the facility. So we need to have a re-engineering the transition between the nursing home and the emergency room. So because of that case that we mentioned earlier, the 80 year old lady, that the, the nursing home had not provide good information. So we, this might happen in many other places. So we need to have a good communication between the nursing home and emergency room. So it means that need a very good structural communication between these two kind of uh, department or facilities, especially in this uh, COVID-19 era that uh, we really need a better judgment. <clears throat> and because the nursing home patient mostly are old, older adults or seniors, they at least 50% they have a dementia. And when they arrive at the ER, they were not able to give better information or medical history or what they want. So we need to prepare for the emergency room department. Especially some open time, the family cannot be there, especially in the COVID-19 situation that family cannot be there either. So there's no good information that the ER can get. So we need to prepare all those information before we transfer the patient to the ER. And we need to call or talk to the ER clinicians about the situation and to discuss whether it's appropriate to send the patient over there or we need we need to keep the patient in the nursing home. And because the, the, <laughs> the nursing home team usually do not work in the hospital, especially in the ER, so don't know what the capacity, what the function in the ER. So we need the better communication. And also in the ER team, they don't they never visit the nursing home. They don't know the culture. They don't know the capacity. And so the both sides need to make the checklist for, for the better communication. And so we can prepare before transfer there or can call them, communicate with them to have better judgment to decide whether should we send the patient over there or not. And also need a good uh, checklist communication that once patient is evaluated in the ER and they decide to send them back to the nursing home, what is what do they have to provide? <clears throat> so they need to give us, give the nursing home the the data or evaluation and the conclusion and then the decision of uh, placements. <clears throat> so this is the kind of issue that we need to think about that and we need to prepare because uh, patient before patient go to the nursing uh, the ER, who is handling this? It is a staff of clinicians, EMS, once they get there, it's a ER triage, ER clinical nurse, then clinicians. So there are many people involved before they make a final decision. So they need to have a better information so they can have better judgment. So now <clears throat> in order to have this 
good uh, communication. We also need to have a good uh, good attitude about the role of the patient and family center. We need to set up this kind of goal of care based on the patient's preference and family preference. So it means the patient and family center. We need to let the emergency room know what the patient wants. So the ACP means the advanced care planning uh, should be available. And we need to let the family, patient probably not able to understand, but the family also need to know that uh, in this COVID-19 situation, open time cannot, we cannot provide what the patient's preference. See, the patient might need us, might want to be in a single room, but probably not possible. And also in the, in the hospital or in the nursing home, patient might get worse and suddenly die or might need to be intubated or those more aggressive management probably not cannot be the candidate for this. So need to prioritize prioritize the patient's uh, the treatment plan that uh, might be patient will be will not be intubated, will not be in ICU and need to be in palliative care. So this has been happening in New York, in Europe, and in all the hospital system now. So before we make this ACP, it's very important to ask if it's possible, the patient, what matters to the patient most? Means the, to initiate with this and talk to the patient, see how is her or his value of the life. And then we go from there and it should have this kind of POLST available. Uh, this is a form that uh, people or nursing home can use for the COVID-19 because uh, the issue is that the very likely uh, the patient won't be intubated and won't be in ICU because uh, from the early uh, data come out, I believe it's a Kirkland, those, uh, those cases, 30% uh, die from the nursing home. And uh, when people are 85 or older, if they have a respiratory failure, the chance to survive is almost zero. So they might decide not to intubate the patient, not to treat the patient aggressively. So in such case, if the patient is in nursing home, probably need to keep the patient in the nursing home because it's uh, fertile and that it's not possible to give aggressive treatment in the hospital. So there's uh, uh, many questions to ask before patient uh, sent to the ER. <clears throat> so the, up to now, just give you the idea that the in the COVID-19 situation that uh, we, we, our resources are limited and we, we are highly risk in, in the nursing home and uh, often time. Once patient was suspected of a COVID-19, we send the patient to the, we might need consider to send the patient to the ER and if the ER cannot provide the screen test of the COVID-19 right away, ER very likely become a nursing home or waiting room. That's impossible for the ER. And then the ER might ask to send the patient back to the nursing home. But the nursing home need to decide to accept the patient or not because the, if 
patient is a positive case, that might be risky to transfer, spread it to other residents. Also, if the patient is positive or possible positive, we, our staff system, can we rearrange for the staffing? Do we have enough PPE or those protection gowns, gloves, those? Can we, are we capable to take care of the, this kind of patient? So it's kind of very, very tough for nursing home. And uh, so very likely now nursing home decide or prefer not to take the patient back. And then now the patient will stay in the emergency room or if possible, they will be admitted to the hospital. But the, the prognosis is poor. So patients for well, the hospital probably don't want to take the patient in because they want to keep the bed for the uh, better candidate or the, some other patients. So that's why they ask us to make a good communication checklist. And they ask our nursing home clinicians, talk to the ER clinicians to discuss whether it's appropriate to send the patient there. Also, once the patient is done the evaluation, patient need to come back to the nursing home. So all those need to have a good communication between two departments. Means the nursing home and the emergency room need to have a better or good communication. So before we send the patient over there. <clears throat> and also the in the nursing home, especially in the COVID-19 uh, pandemic now that the, the capability of doing the STAT test, STAT chest X-ray, also the medication delivery, all those possible will be delayed for several hours. So it's not like the hospital, they can do it right away within 30 minutes or one hour. So we need to think about this and also discuss with the emergency room for better arrangement. And for the medically stable patient, usually they will not accept the patient or they will recommend that we keep the patient in the nursing home and isolate the patient and care until the patient's condition get much worse that the, that's beyond our capability to take care of patient then transfer there. And then still need to communicate with the ER so they would have better idea to accept this or how to approach this, especially the ACP patient need to have this data available. So before or the, when they accept this patient, they know what's the direction. So those are the issues that we need to prepare. So one thing is we need to talk. We need to have a better communication with the ER before we transfer and also after transfer back to nursing home. So up to now, the first question about this lady, what is our current recommendation of addressing COVID-19 in a nursing home? That's the issue that the government want us try not to send the patient over there too early until the patient's condition is really, really bad and is beyond our capability to take care of patient. And that's why that is mean, need to make sure patient is an ACP to guide us or guide the both side, nursing home and ER to decide how to take care of the patient and also might be palliative care for the patient. And the second question is just uh, talking about the difference of uh, nursing homes, long-term care, subacute care, they are all different, different uh, staffing, different uh, preparation, different uh, 
clinical uh, capability to take care of this kind of patient. Now, question three is uh, if this case uh, decide not to admit the patient and transfer back to the ER uh, to the nursing home, can we say no or are we capable? Are we ready to take care of the patient back? So need to prepare and decide whether it's yes or no. And also this number four is uh, before we transfer a patient to the ER and we call them and also need to provide the basic medical information like a past history and uh, current conditions and uh, AC, ACP or POLST and also what the family wants and what the patient's uh, preference and what is the, our judgment to guide the ER doctor know what, what to do. So that's what they call warm handoff, means uh, just give them a call and give them detail or better information or discuss with them, means uh, consult with the ER doctor, see if it's necessary or if we can keep the patient in the nursing home or is this appropriate to transfer patient to the ER? And here also that they need to have an SCP for the ER to have a better decision that the patient need to be intubated. Can we do it? Or is it appropriate or have to let go? And to prepare for ACP, especially for this COVID-19 uh, era, we need to have a special POLST for this because the open time of many cases that uh, this fertile, that they probably will not do anything on the patient. So we need to have uh, this uh, data or this documentation available. So still, again, we are medical team. We work together and we work very hard and very nervous, but we try. Hopefully someday we can have good relax. Now, this is a, the issue that once the patient is back and it's positive case, what should we do? But I don't think we, uh, and this topic, this issue right now, we can, we are capable of taking care of this kind of patient. But this is uh, many slides that I attend the CME of Swedish hospital. They have COVID team, 19 team, and they talk about this with the hospitalist. So I just uh, snapshot of those pic, uh, slide and uh, just uh, share with you and just have uh, some idea. What do they do now? Still, uh, you probably know this picture. Uh, it's been in the, on the internet that the WHO become WH disinformation that uh, caused lots of casualties and lots of loss financially, economically, and life, and also value lots of people die. So we are suffering because of this disinformation. And we are medical team. We are so scared because of the uncertainty of the SARS-2. Uh, the pandemic, and we are very nervous to face this highly risky Wuhan pneumonia, and we still have to take care of the, our patients. So we need to get together and work together. No compassion fatigue. So again, we work very carefully and nervously, and we do our job very seriously, Hopefully we are safe. So this is uh, April 10, the, the data of the COVID-19 cases. The United States is, well, 496,000 now and uh, 18,000 deaths. And uh, Washington State still pretty, pretty uh, high preference or high uh, incidence. Right now we are kind of the flatting, but uh, still very risky. So we have 
it's almost 9,000 cases and 400 deaths, only 891 recover. So we have a strategy according to the state that we are right now, we are here. And they are kind of, they have, we have preparation for the emergency outbreak much higher. So they can keep prepare for the hospital or the facility to take care of them. So hopefully we can, for the long term, we can flat this curve in two years, by end of the 2021. So we are expecting this long durations of pandemic. So suppose we have this kind of case, I think uh, we already have those kind of PPE. You need the gloves, gongs, protection eyes, shoes, coat for the shoes, mask, facial mask, all those. We, I, I think we are prepared, but I know the surprise is kind of low. So very, very nervous. So again, we discussed about this, that the virus come in on the eyes, nose, mouth, into the upper airway, and then into the lower airway, and that cause a viola damage, and cause the failure of the lungs, respiratory failure, and then the fatigue, and then die. So this is uh, from the Swedish hospital. I think then the COVID team that went to this decide to discharge the patient to nursing home. So the COVID-19 patient, they, after they were treated and freed of symptoms for 72 hours, then do the test. If it's still positive, then wait for another 72 hours. If this is psycho, it's still positive. Or if it's a negative, then wait for 24 hours and repeat the test. If it's a negative, then discharge to nursing home. So we are in this location that we need to prepare if we need to take this kind of patient. Now, this is a definition of the COVID-19, the diagnosis. There was three major criteria. That means uh, <clears throat> fever, over 99.6 degree, the 88.7% in the hospital, they have fever, or the cough, 67.8%, or dyspnea, 38%, or X-ray shows abnormality, about 60%. So three criteria are positive, means confirmed case. Or two of these criteria, and one or two of the minor criteria. That means the uh, lymphocytopenia, 60% of this, or CRP greater than 10, 56.4%, or abnormal liver function, 40%, or D-dimer, 60%, or non-exposure to confirmed cases, or high risk comorbidities like diabetes, hypertension, cardiovascular disease, chronic lung disease, cancer or transplant patients. So those are minor criteria. So if two of the major criteria and two are minor also confirm, or one or major and four or minor also confirm. And the severity of the illness uh, depends on the temperature and the P PO2 and the uh, respiratory rate and, and other condition that uh, some minor, severe and critical condition. So those area, critical condition, the all mostly are intubated and, and very, very tough. And for the baseline assessment in the hospital, they will do all those tests, the vital sign and lab, probably just for information. They do lots of tests and x-ray and, and then a serial follow-up, also something vital sign, those tests, 
and x-ray and uh, echo if it's indicated. So the Swedish respiratory protocol is here. They use the oxygen and the breathing mask, non-breathing mask, the, and then the intubation. And the, maintaining the safe environment and minimize the procedure for the staff to re reduce the risk. I'll call you the M in the meeting, okay? And for those uh, algorithms that uh, they use the oxygen, if it's a full code, if the patient is still kind of mild, so in the regular flow, they use the do not generate aerosol. So no air, if the patient not on the aerosol, so no air bone isolation required because means the, the oxygen is in, one to six liters and uh, non repressor is one to 15. But if condition get worse, then they need to use the aerosol, then they need the precautions. So this is uh, cases in the hospital. If patient become a DNR because uh, the condition get worse, then a different level of care and oxygen and uh, use uh, oxygen therapy. So basically they don't use nebulizer anymore unless it's intubated. Okay, so we need to change to MDI and uh, nebulizer only for the intubated patient. So this is their uh, algorithm Okay, we probably don't need to. Now in the treatment, they use a uh, hydroxychloroquine and uh, uh, Oxygen therapy. Some of the case use a uh, rendezvous or calitra, or those are experimental medicines, but now it's available in the hospital. And respiratory therapy and the intubation. So, so the drug therapy right now use a uh, hydroxychloroquine and uh, antibiotics like as uh, uh, cetriaxone and uh, adethromycin. And right now still early, but uh, some reports there's a pretty good result. Also, they are using uh, experimental medicine if it's pretty bad situation. Uh, they have a, if patients can recover and they have a guideline for the iso isolation remove, they have protocols. And also they have a drop teams to help in the community. If we have a suspected, suspected cases, uh, they have people come to help the facility to, to take care of the patient outside the hospital. And still need to protect the patient and caregiver if in the nursing home or in the outside the facilities, like identify the symptomatic patient early and isolate them and also if the staff or caregiver are uh, symptomatic, they cannot come to work, or they have to be careful protections and use the PPE and uh, still personal hygiene and clean the environment. So this is a uh, drop team. Now I want to show this is that there's a COVID-19 team in the unit uh, of the unit in the Swedish hospital. Is a standard uh, card that the uh, wipe and the uh, gloves and the gong, and this is a unit, same thing. And this is a non COVID unit, means a possible, the uh, uh, possible cases isolation. They use a uh, kind of territory uh, reminding the, the cases and the stuff. So this is there, the non covid unit. And same thing uh, to downing or topping. I think this is quite standard. And the staffing is 
kind of uh, tough because uh, right now we're shortage of medical professional. So they are recruiting from everywhere across the US from other state and then give the credentials and then start working. Even the medical student for the year or resident of fellowship hospital, they start working. Now, this is telemedicine. They use this to help communicate with the possible cases at home and those. And this is, we probably need to talk about this in the future. And <clears throat> also that they help our medical team to, to uh, avoid the burnout. So they have a meditation and uh, um, mindfulness, meaningful connection, mastery and mobility and health program, wellness program to help our medical team to relax and uh, keep good spirit to, at work. And uh, they have pretty good communication every, every day for endorsements for every team. So uh, I think this is about the, the end that uh, we've been talking about, uh, how the nursing home prepare to face this epic 19 Wuhan pneumonia cases and what should we prepare and what should we do before we transfer patient to the ER? We need to prepare those documents and have a good communication with the ER also with the family to have a good uh, P-O-L-S-T or a, a, a advanced care planning for the, the appropriate care because uh, it's some kind of uncertainty and patient change so fast that the some open time is not what we can expect it. So we need to ex prepare. And uh, we need to face this pandemic for, I don't know how long, but it could be two years and the end of the next year, hopefully earlier. So stay healthy and be happy and work together. And hopefully we can have travel again since the gas oil price is so low. And uh, get ready to face this. Okay, this is the end of my talk today. Hope it's helpful for prepare and stay healthy and happy. Bye.